everybody, and welcome back to the inn. We are here. We're continue continuing to go over uh, Knights of the Frozen Cone Thrones cards. Yeah, Knights of the Frozen Cones, everyone. And it's time to uh, continue right on, starting with Happy Ghoul. Happy Ghoul is a three cost three three minion with the effect that it costs zero if your hero was healed this turn. Um, hello, free to play minion and priest. Uh, other. Other classes can use this as use this as well, but really it's going to be priest that's going to be getting the most use to, use out of this. Uh, they can they can heal up and they can drop this uh, drop this puppy on two if they want. They can drop this puppy anytime they want. It's just pretty much a zero cost for a, a zero cost three three is actually pretty strong, and this this will be really good for a minion based priest. This is if you need something to kind of slot in. It's not a bad choice in a priest deck. Uh, anywhere else, I'm not really sure if you'll use it much, but you could with lifesteal. But, um, yeah, it's, it's not bad. Man, they are really attempting to go out of their way, at least from the looks of it, with this set, to just go, you know, that three slot? That's going to be a really, really, really contested slot for just about any deck in any class. Like, you mentioned it yourself, I mean, this is a great card for Priest, and yeah, it is, but also when you take a look at Priest, they have Shadow Word Death at 3, Acolyte of Agony at 3, and now if you want to run this, this is also something that goes into that 3 slot area, so it's just like, you know, it gives you ideas to be able to go, like, hey, I could put this into that 3 slot, or I can put this... Or, like, also another one of the ones for please Priest's sake, uh, Cabal Talent Priest. And it's just like, ugh, you gotta figure out what you want to do with your deck. And I like that. Except, I Eddie, really this is not a three-cost minion. This is a zero-cost minion. Didn't you see the cost? <sighs> it's only zero-cost if you heal your... And your <laughs> Priest. Guess what you're going to do? I know what you're going to potentially do for two mana. Heck, if you're playing uh, playing Reno Priest or any sort of Highlander Priest, you could heal yourself for zero mana, play the stuff for zero mana, and still have the rest of your turn. Yes, you can. But I'm just mainly going on along the lines of, like, hey, three cost slot. But I believe we can shift gears... And move on to Despicable Dreadlord. Despicable Dreadlord, he's a 5 cost, 4 5 demon for Warlock. At the end of your turn, deal 1 damage to all enemy minions. Okay. Priest can't deal with you very easily because of your 4 attack, which is okay. You deal one damage in a whirlwind effect on my opponent's board. Hmm. No drawbacks for me. That's that's new. Hmm. You're a demon. I can I can get behind that. Five cost, that's where I'm just going. Ugh. Other than that, it's not too horrible of a card. As far as seeing play goes, I have to wait to see how the meta kind of like shift and shape before I go. It's going here. But yeah, it's a pretty nice card. Bulb. This is a very strong card. Uh, five, five cost, four, five with, with an ability or even a, uh, a tribal, modif a tribal uh, modifier. That's not bad, and the ability is essentially that at the, at the end of every single one of your turns, it deals one damage to all of the enemy minions. So this kind of controls aggro. It kind of can give you a a, 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 a a heads up as far as dealing with other board board states, and that can help you later on really combo with the file. This is a very strong card for Warlock in general. It won't see play in like Zoo. But pretty much any other Warlock deck, I think this is going to be an auto-include. It's a very strong card. I really like this card. I think you're going to see this a lot in Warlock. 
Whether Warlock's going to be in the meta, meta or not, that's going to be up in the air. But if so, expect to see this card. Next up, we have Malfurion the Pestilent. Now, this is the uh, Druid uh, Death Knight, and essentially, you play, he's a let me, he's a seven cost Death Knight. Uh, when, and when he comes in, he basically has the ability of choose one. You either summon two poisonous spiders or two scarabs, scarabs with, with taunt. And then his hero power is two is two cost Plague Lord, uh, which we, where's a choose one hero power where you can either get three attack this turn or three armor. This is really powerful all around. Uh, seven seven cost slot means it's going to be very easily to, very easy to actually play this uh, play this death knight compared to. Uh, Compared to other class death knights, uh, choosing between spiders or scarabs, uh, the taunt scarabs could be uh, handy as well as the poisonous spiders. And the hero power is just incredibly strong. You you either tank up, which is almost equivalent to the old uh, Justicar Justicar warrior power, or three attack to to essentially attack face or attack a minion. This is strong. Not to mention the fact that the choose one ability when it comes in and the hero power actually work with uh, Fangel Staghelm, so you can get both of them if if he's on the field. This is this is so strong. This is incredible for Druid. Does Druid play this in every single one of its decks? No. But I think I think Big Druid could play him. I think um, any sort of controlling board oriented Druid could play this. It's a just a very strong death not death uh, death knight in, in general. And I think we're gonna see see this one a lot. See I don't know that. I think we're going to see this one a lot. I see him and I go, all right, alongside Fandral Staghelm, that thing is just wicked nasty. You're getting three attack and three armor. I just look at this and I go, like, it's really strong. Don't get me wrong. But it's just like, what? style of deck are you going to want to run this with? Are we going to want to go tanky? Are we going to want to go like the taunts that just seem to be going right in with Druid now? Or are we just going to want to go like, eh, we'll go a different route entirely? I'm, I'm honestly thinking it'll end up in like a taunt style Druid that just goes and just goes, all right, Wall time. That way, whenever you play it, it's like, oh, I want those two poisonous spiders. So that way, my opponent, whenever he plays something, I can just go and little sacrifice here, little sacrifice there, and then march forward with my big wall of taunts, just bop, bop. So yeah, like it, it's a it's strong death knight. But are we good? Well, um, I I do think that this card can actually see play in most Druid decks, if not depending on your build, if not all Druid decks. I think it's that good a card. I think that the Battle Cry Choose One ability can be incredibly strong and is probably stronger than a lot of people are giving it credit for. And its hero power is just really strong overall. I, I don't think this is a build around Death Knight. I think this is a Death Knight you can pretty much slot in whichever Druid deck you really want. Because I don't think that its abilities or its battle cries are specialized. It gives you it gives you control options. It gives you defense options. It gives you whatever the heck you want. So I don't think it's going. I don't know how where I'm going to put this. It's I think it really is a a universal card if you really want to treat it that way. It's one of the few death knights I can actually say that about. On one end, yes. On the other end, I don't know if you want to put this in like your aggro tone druid. Well, with aggro token, it's too it's uh, too slow. Yeah. But so to, like to be fair, like, Wait. to be <laughs> fair, most druid decks tend to be mid rangey or uh, long term ramp ramp style decks. The aggro decks are you know anomalies when it comes to how the class wants to get run, wants to get ran. Yeah. Uh, other than that, you, you you can run these in most decks. And, in fact, you might even want to consider this as a late-game option in an aggro deck, because just in case you get to turn 7, being able to play this, buff up, and then put down, like, two Poison Spires or, or uh, some other tokens, 
and then being able to attack for three every turn with your hero power might just be worth it. Also, hey, if anything, we can put it in Jade Druid and just make it to where Jade Druid just keeps armor up. <laughs> um, if we if it really gets to the point where most Jade Druids uh, don't stop running uh, Earthen Scales, I think they may. Very well, might. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the fact that uh, two points uh, either uh, taunts could actually help protect protect them as they try to get even as they try to get the more, the bigger jades out or they can put the poison spiders out there to get rid of uh, bigger threats to protect themselves while they get the bigger uh, jades out so yeah this could see play in jade druid it may not see play in jade druid i'm on the fence on that for my jade druid deck it's really going to depend on how the meta really hashes out i guess you have things shake out and i like that so if anything i'm gonna go ahead and my way on over the sword Two cost, one two. Choose one. Transform into a one two with poisonous, or a one five with taunt. I'm really looking to see how this interaction is going to go when it comes time for it to hit board with Fandral. Because it's like a one five taunt poisonous. Ugh. That's disgusting to think about. But it might, time, it's just like, hmm. Does it will it be a one five or will it combine the uh, the stats like it does with uh, Druid like Druid of the Claw or whatever? Because then wouldn't it be Ooh. a two wouldn't it be a two seven Tom Poisonous? No, because with Druid of the Claw, it's choose one you get wealth and Tom. And so with Fandral interaction there, it, it goes, okay, charge, and the plus two health and taunt that goes on top of it. Well, then, wait, hang on. Then again, the other one that has, because I can't think it came out last set. And it was the 3-5 with stealth. Oh, excuse me, the 5-3 plus stealth, or the 3-5 plus taunt, and then you put the two on top of each other, and then 5-5 stealth taunt. It may go that route. Yeah, it will either be a 1-7 or 1-5, but um, it will have taunt and poisonous. Either way, it'll have that disgusting ability. 4-2. And that's just... Ugh. Um, this puts a really hard stopper on uh, aggression decks, especially being able to just drop it on two, and then on three if you want to, you can go, and we're going out with Tar Creeper, and then on four, you just go something else. But but yeah, I like Druid of the Swarm. Really solid, decent card. I'm going to throw it to you now, Bald. Yeah, Druid of the Swarm is actually pretty good in uh, in the current way that the meta is probably shape is shaped up now is more likely to shape up because um, it either gives you a little bit of defense, especially early in the game. That one five will be kind of strong, or even a one two poisonous, that, which could be good later in the game. So I mean, it's a good all around card for Druid, and I, it's definitely going to see play. It's it might even be meta defining. So yeah, I expect to see this card a lot. So, next up, we have Uther the Ebon Blade, of the Ebon, Bl Ebon Blade, who is the uh, Paladin Death Knight. He's a 9-cost Death Knight with the battle cry, equip a 5-3 lifesteal life weapon. That's powerful enough by itself. But then his hero power is the 4 Horsemen. It costs 2, and it summons a 2-2 two, two Horseman. And if you happen to have all 4... You destroy the enemy hero and win the game. Oh, this thing is nuts. Well, it it is nine mana, so it's going. To, it's it's essentially an in game plan. This is not going to go in most of your paladin decks. It's not going to go in your aggro based paladin decks. So Murlockadin, it's not going to do. It's not going to fit in there. It's not going to fit in any sort of aggro deck. But any paladin deck that is looking for late game value, uh, especially maybe something like uh, Control Paladin. This could be a a finisher for the for the deck. 
this essentially, aside from Ashbringer, which you you will get from uh, Tyrion, from your Tyrion, this gives you a five three weapon as well, and it has life steal. It's an Ashbringer with freaking life steal, guys. And if that's not enough, you have a hero power power where if you, especially if you're playing control. And you have those ni- that those nice taunts and ways to control the board, and ha- where it's really hard for the opponent to destroy things. You basically can, you know, over the course of four turns, you put horsemen on the board, and if they're unable to destroy them, and you can get the fourth one on the board, you win. This is crazy for a control paladin deck. Uh, like I said, I don't think it's going to be in every single paladin deck. It, it definitely doesn't fit in the more aggro-based uh, decks. Might not fit in mid range. We'll have to see what kind of mid range decks come out come to play. I don't know if whether it'll fit in you know stuff like Buffeton or uh, Quest Paladin because of their focus on on buffs and strengthening existing minions. But definitely, I think we will see this in like the sl- the slower control based decks. And in those decks, yeah, you're going to have to start worrying on controlling their board, and that could be a really good turnaround for the Paladin decks. Uther of the Ebon Blade. This, for me, like, as soon as I saw it, I just went over to my notepad, and I just went, and I'm gonna add you to the list of cards I want. Thing is nuts! It's crazy! Like, one of, I would say, the best Death Knights printed. And it's just like, yes, it's on 9. And if I've already used up my, like, my Ashbringer, so it's like, bam, hit something for five, bam, hit something else for five, bam, and I'm still alive, oh, look, I'm going to drop this, get another Ashbringer with that lifesteal, and then just keep on going. I mean, it's practically 30 damage, I would say, over six turns. So... If anything, I expect people to be running weapon tech because, like, you don't want Uther of the Ebon Blade to have that weapon. But it's just, it's so good. It is so good. And now we've already got people all theory crafting. I'm like, oh, well, how can we make it to where Uther's hero power with the four horsemen can be OTK? And it's just like, let's not get that crazy. I am not going to go that bonkers trying to make the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse actually stay on the board. Yes, it's a possibility that it could happen in a control-style deck. And I think that's where Uther of the Ebon Blade is going to find its home, is in those control-style decks. But, it's just... I think people are going to start running more weapon tech because of the threat of the Ebon Blade. And it's just like, hmm. <sighs> Hello, Paladin, my old friend. I'm coming back to you again. Just slowly. Because it's just, ugh. Are we good on Uther? Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Moving on to Blackguard. Six cost three nine pound and minion. Whenever your hero is healed, deal that much damage to a random enemy minion. All right. So the deal stuff that works with paladin. That's pretty nifty. Being able to hit myself with a forbidden healing for twenty to just be able to look at my opponent's board and go, one of your minions is going to die, or at least eliminating everything else on board and then going, that minion is going to die. I don't even care. Combos well with... Ivory Knight. And because of how big its butt is, it's hard to get rid of this thing. Um... As far as it seeing play, I'm not sure because it's like, yeah, you can paint it away, you can hit it with Bookworm to be able to get rid of it in your Dragon Style decks. Outside of that realm, it's difficult to use resources to get rid of it. So it's just like, hmm, 
will it see play? I say maybe, and it realistically depends on the deck. Like, you can just start saying screw it and saying, I'm going to run forever fatigue paladin and just go, okay, I can play healing lights now and just go, I'm healed for this much. That thing on the board dies. And just do an all out assortment of things. Bubble will throw to you. Um, this could be good, I think, in a lifesteal deck. Um, like if you're run, if Paladin run, does run some sort of life lifesteal deck with um, some other healing, but I guess it just depends on how the meta shapes up and how Paladin decides they want to run. Um, if Paladin is not going to do anything with lifesteal, which I think lifesteal is going to be the clincher here, uh, because. Because I'm not sure that other without life steal, I'm not sure that the other healing effects Paladin has is enough to really justify this card. And I think in that's in those slots, Paladin has much better options than Blackguard. It's a card that per, part of me goes, I kind of want the C play. I kind of want to try and figure out something to, something interesting with this card. But the realistic part of me says, I'm not sure if anybody is going to build a deck that justifies this card actually being in it. So. It could be cool to see it in the deck, in a, in a deck. I'm just not sure if we will. Next up, we have Forge of Souls, which is a two-cost two warrior spell that says draw two weapons from your deck. This could be really good in weapon-centric decks, but there really aren't a lot of weapon-centric decks. So maybe, maybe, I don't know, does Pirate Warrior run this just to make sure they have their Arcanite Reapers just so they can uh, smork you in the, in the face more? I, I don't know, because um, if it's not a deck like that, I'm not sure what kind of warrior deck runs this. I would more or less throw it in the, like, control style of warrior deck, because it's just like, okay, I need my gore howl, and I need a potential other weapon just to be able to play for cheap for right now. Pirate Warrior could run it because of like okay i need my weapons to be able to just go crazy and hard in the paint against my opponent because i need to go face 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 repeatedly so it's it's one of those like yes it could however it's just like with pirate warrior it's just one of those you're trying to be so smorky and just so, like, you. You deal with what's on my board. I'm just going to keep going face. Nah, 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 nah. So I don't know if this gets put into it. Like, it thins the deck, yes. But it's just, ugh. I don't know. But I'm not sure about, about control, because control is like, yeah, they can use some of these weapons, but they have other, op other options that if they don't have weapons they can essentially control the board. That's what the deck's all about. Yeah. So I'm not sure that if Control is really going to use this either. It needs to be a weapon-focused warrior deck. And we really haven't seen a lot of them. The most weapon-focused deck right now is Pirate Warrior. And that's, I'm going, I'm throwing that out. Maybe they use it, but even then I'm not going, I don't know. I think that they have better options. Yeah. So it's just like, we'll see. We'll see where this shapes out. I think I can shift and boogie on over to Snow Fury Giant. It's an 11 cost, 8-8 eight, eight, Shaman Elemental that costs one less for each mana crystal you've overloaded this game. Okay, so if I want to run Control Shaman, I can easily run two lightning storms, two volcanoes, two of the lightning bolts. So that's right there alone, six mana off this thing. Is it? Because uh, um, lightning storm is two. Yep. So if you run and two, volcano. that's four. Volcano is what, two? I am doing terrible math because I'm only counting each of that will be eight. I mean, that yep. alone already takes this takes the cost down to three. Thank you for magic for me, Bob. Me no. Ah. <laughs> uh... I mean, j 
just that alone kind of justifies its inclusion. Yeah, yeah, and again, thank you for mapping for me. Me, I'm terrible. Me only know how to count to 30, apparently. <laughs> One, two, anyway, yeah. I think it can be, like, you can definitely throw it in with Elemental Shaman. This thing cannot be devolved because, well, I mean, it can be devolved it can. into, like, another 10 cost. cost. But it's just like, what 10 cost would you want it to be devolved into? Because it's just like, oh god, look at all the 10 costs. And a lot of those 10 costs actually have higher stats. Yeah, so it's just like, ugh. Ugh. So, if anything, I'll just kick this over to you so you can do, you know, do your thing, because with me, nope, no math here. Yeah, you can very easily get this, you can get this cheap very quickly with just some of the basic spells shaman will, shamans will tend to pack, especially like a more control-oriented shaman. Um, we just mentioned t uh, running c two copies of two spells, and we got down to three. You throw in the, you just throw in a lightning bolt, you pretty much have a free, you have free giants. <laughs> really easily. So this will be easy to put up. It's going to be hard for your for your opponent to really deal with. And yeah, I mean this could find its way into uh, to maybe some control shamans as a finisher into different into different shaman decks. Um, but I guess it's going to I guess it's really going to depend on the deck and the build because they because at that point they may be thinking they want a different type of finisher and Snow Fury Giant just might not fit the build. But I think it could see play with its effect. I was a little iffy on it, but when we started really doing the math, it's like going, yeah, Shaman can get this really cheap really quickly, uh, to the point where it might end up being a problem. But uh, I really am not sure if it will be a problem, just because I think those type of Shaman decks might have other routes they want to take, and might decide that Snow Fury Giant isn't worth it. But we'll see. I think this has a real chance of actually making it into the meta. So, next up, we have Night Howler. Night Howler is a card. Night Howler is a 4-cost, 3-4 minion, with the effect, whenever this minion takes damage, gain plus 2 attack. Alrighty, then. Uh, it could be used in, in some decks, but I think that where this is really going to find its home is the new version of... Enrage Warrior or Emulation Warrior or Patron Warrior, if you go into if you want to go into Wild, basically in a Warrior deck that is already going to be damaging the minions and buffing up this uh, buffing up the attack. Uh, there are other better minions that get more attack when they get uh, damaged, though. So I'm not sure how much play this is really going to be, going to be going to get get at all. So yeah, I'm not sure we're going to see much of this card. I'm in the same boat here, cause it's just like I, eh. I look at it and it's just like, whenever it takes damage, gain plus two attack. Okay, so we could potentially look at the next cart up, which is a Gurabashi Berserker, which is a five cost two seven, that gains plus three attack, whenever it takes damage, and that can go and become insane so it's just like i feel this is pack filler so it's just like that's where right now i'm gonna kind of sit and look at it but f for now if anything i'm gonna go ahead and shift on into haldronir frost rider it's a three cost four four battle cry freeze your other minions I'm already looking at you, and I'm like, alright, free shaman one, two of you. Or just, you know, decks in general that aren't going to have too much of a board to start off, want you. Because you're a three cost four four, and that's nice. So, I can see this being played a good bit. Bulb? Yeah, I agree with you, because those are kind of the points I was going to make. I think, though, main, its main home is going to be Frost Shaman. Um, and they can play this early on the board, either with minions that they don't care aren't going to attack, 
or basically just by itself, or they can hold off until later in the game with Morabi and use this as a way to get minions into their hand. So this has this has this has more uses in Frost Shaman than I think any other deck. I think any other deck this is probably a, a card you want to pass over. But in Frost Shaman in particular, I think this is where it's particularly strong. But we'll see what happens, I guess, in the, in the new meta. But, speaking of Frost Shaman, next up we have Avalanche, which is a 4-cost Shaman spell that, says, that freezes a minion and then deals 3 damage to adjacent ones. This is nice! Uh, the freeze effect is going to be nice. It stops something that you don't want to attack, and it can be used to help clear off the board. Uh, this is a really nice control spell, which is essentially what uh, Frost Shaman is shaping up to be, which is a control deck. And I kind of like this. Um, when I saw this get played uh, during the, uh, reveal the last reveal stream, I looked at this and said, this is a nice card. Not only in, Fr in Frost Shaman, but this is a very decent uh, control-oriented Shaman spell in the first place. This is definitely going to be, uh, this is definitely going to see play, and this is potentially meta-defining. I am really excited about this card. I think we're going to see this card a lot. Oh yeah, I can completely agree with you there. Just, oh look, that card gets frozen, and now the other two beside it get three damage. It makes you really have to sit and think about your board positioning of how you're going to position your minions. It gives another layer to Hearthstone as just a player in general and makes you have to think. And I like those kinds of cards. Plus, just with the ability to be able to just control everything, yes. Just, yes. Meta-defining, most certainly. So, I get to boogie on over to Arphus. He's a 4-cost, 2-2, two -two beast, neutral legendary, with the death rattle at a random Death Knight card to your hand. First of all, we are having a straight-up legit battle for cutest card in the set. And this thing summoning animation is adorable. I'm not even going to lie. But, if anything, let me get into the real with actual Arphus. Because he has Death Knight cards. Now, Death Knight cards, which are right here on your screen, there are eight of them. I'm going to go over each one real quick. So the first one is Frostmourne. Seven cost, five, three weapon. Death Rattle, summon every minion killed by this weapon. Army of the Dead, six cost. Remove the top five cards of your deck. Summon any minions removed. That's disgusting for deck thinning and board con control. Because it's just, oh look, here's my board, it's now flooded with minions, and yeah, sure, I may be lost two or three other cards in the mix, but, ooh, board. Doom Pact. Destroy all minions. Remove the top card from your deck for each minion destroyed. That hurts, but you're nuking the board for five. Death Grip. It's two cost. Uh, steal a minion from your de opponent's deck and add it to your hand. You're literally going, oh, let me just reach over to your deck, grab a card out of it, and now it's mine. Thank you. Death Coil. Deal five damage to an enemy or restore five health to a friendly character. I like that. Give and take. Obliterate. Destroy a minion. Your hero takes damage equal to its health. Tit for tat. Anti-magic shell. Give your minions plus two, plus two, and can't be targeted by spells or hero powers. That's disgusting! Just completely and utterly disgusting. And then, death and decay. Um, three cost. Deal three damage to all enemies. So a quick AoE if you need it. But just... Wow. Just one out of eight, and you're getting something that can change the game for you 
and your opponent. Um, as far as Arthas goes, while being cute and adorable, like I think it could see play because of its death rattle and death rattle centric decks. No doubt or question in my mind. But which ones does it find its home in is the better question. And this is where I just kind of kick the ball in Bob's direction and go, Bob, tell me where it goes. Yeah, I think death rattle focused decks really find a home for Arfus. Um, I think you definitely want to be running this in, in some sort of an Azoth deck. Uh, Necromancer, I've actually been thinking about it. I think this definitely finds a home in my, home in my Necromancer deck. I think this finds a home in uh, Quest Priest, Awaken the Makers. Uh, this may find a home in, in like a, a Beast Hunter type deck. But if nothing else, its effect has the possibility of really spicing up your zombie selections if you are actually playing that hero power. But you know each of the each of the effects. Frostmourne is crazy. It's nuts. You're pretty much, you know, you're going to you're shooting to use it to get rid of minions instead of going face anyway, and then you're resummoning them so you can kind of swing the board. Army of the De Dead in the right deck at the right time <coughs> can flood the board. It can make it really scary. Doom Pact is a way of just of just wiping the board if you really need it. Otherwise, you might steer clear. You know, Anti Magic Shell is incredibly strong. Death Grip, actually taking a minion out of the deck, deck, so it's not copying. It's actually taking it and putting it in your hand to play. Death's Coil is just strong all around, being able to being able to damage or heal depending on where you target or how you decide what you want to do. I like that 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 amount of play, that type of play, that amount of power and decision making. It's great. Obliterate can be great too. You have to keep all this in an account, and you may, who knows, you may even want to weaken the minion you want to minion you want to kill before you out, outright destroy it. It's going to be up to you. And Death and Decay, an actual really strong, really good death route, uh, really good AOE that hurts the uh, hero as well. Yes, please. I, I like them all. They're I, well, I like most of these Death Knight cards, and Arfis gives you one. But you know what? I think that's going to be fine in the deck decks that's going to be in it. It doesn't need to be the Lich King, which we'll talk about later. The value for Arfus is just getting that once. Maybe he'll come back and you get it again. But really, I think in the decks that Arfus is being ran in, the value is in Death Rattle Minions anyway, and you really don't need Death Knight cards showing up all the time just to give you value. So I think he's going to be very strong in particular decks. I don't think he's going to be an auto-include in every deck, but he's probably going to be strong in the decks that are going to want to include him. Uh, because the whole point, again, if you're running a Death Row deck, is you want that Death Row to go off. Uh, you don't want to just kill it to kill it. You're going to want to use it to help control the board, run things into it, or you force your opponent to kill it, kill it themselves. And that way you'll that way the Death Row will go off and you, will go off and you, you'll get the ability. It does have a weakness to uh, to Potion of Madness, but I don't think that's a reason not to play this card in those decks. And you can have other minions that you can probably probably play around with that, so that you know that might not be an issue. So yeah, I think there's definitely going to be see, definitely going to see play, but it should be seeing play in very specific decks because otherwise, I don't think it's strong enough to really uh, support any other archetypes. Okay, so next up, we have Furnace Fire Colossus. Furnace Fire, Furnace Fire Colossus is a six cost six cost six six. Neutral minion with the battle cry. Discard all weapons from your hand and gain their stats. While we have weapon-based classes, there really aren't a lot of what I would call weapon-based decks. Basically, uh, class decks that basically focus on their weapons, on having a lot of wep on having a number of weapons, and then using them using them that way. Even Warrior doesn't have a weapon-focused deck. They, there's Control Warrior, and then there's Pirate Warrior that use the most weapons, but they're not using that many of them. Um, Rogue, at the, at the moment, really isn't using weapons besides the Hero Power, and I'm not sure if that's really going to change with the new meta. And Hunter really only uses Eagle Horn Bow. And in, the, in those cases, I don't think you want to discard your weapons just to make this thing bigger. I don't think it's worth it at the 6-cost slot. I don't think those type of decks are going to run it. For Hunter, it's too slow, and they're going to have uh, Savannah High Main, which just works out better for them. Uh, I think Rogue... Rogue is not going to be running... I don't think it's going to be running weapons, which means First Fire Colossus is not not really going to be 
impressive. I mean, it's a vanilla 6 cost 6 6, but when you start getting to the 6 cost slot, you, slots, you kind of want your 6 cost minions to actually to actually do things. If you wanted a 6 cost 6 6, you would put uh you would put uh Stormwind Guard, uh Stormwind Champion in there. So, you're not going to put uh, first fire colossus. Maybe in warrior, but if you're if you are running a weapon specific warrior deck, I'm not sure you would want them to get discard for Furnace Fire Colossus. So I'm not really sure this sees play. It's an interesting effect, but it's an effect that the type of... Oh, I forgot Paladin. Um, I'm not sure Paladin plays this, to be honest, because, Pal because I think Paladin has other things on their mind uh, for about that, that cost and in those decks, so... I don't even think Paladin plays this because they want to use their weapons for very specific reasons. And again, most Paladin decks don't run a lot of weapons. And the weapons they do care about are given to them by Battle Cry, so they're not going to be discarded anyway. Pretty much you would maybe be, maybe be discarding a True Silver Champion. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think First Fire of Colossus is going to see a lot of play because I, I just don't think uh, for its stat line and for its cost... Uh, for a battle cry that's probably not going to trigger, that you probably probably do not want to do not want to trigger, I just don't think it's going to be worth it to play in any deck. Check, 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 and just keep on checking them boxes, Bob. <laughs> I here. Do you do you just want to take the words right out of my mouth again? <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? Alright, I mean, if anything, like, you hit everything on the head for me, so it's just like, I, I can't really much say anything else that you haven't already. So, if anything, I want to move on. I have been dying to actually sit down and gush about. And that's the main man himself, the Lich King. He's an 8 cost, 8-8 eight, eight, taunt. At the end of your turn, add a random Death Knight card to your hand. So, first of all, 1 and 8 for those Death Knight cards. Second of all, meta-defining card. Third of all, you're auto-crafting this. Dr. 8 for number 4. This thing is amazing. I can honestly say that this thing will probably pop up in so many different decks that I figure we could potentially see the resurgence of Big Game Hunter. Because it's just like, alright, yeah, no, not having that. Just not at all. Taunt Warrior, you have this card in your deck at this point. Hands down, no questions asked. Just, I need the Lich King. As soon as I saw it, saw what it did, and just went, okay, I'm just going to write you down. I'm going to make sure I put stars all beside you. I texted Bob. I'm like, Bob, you're auto-crafting this card more than likely. Because <laughs> it's just good just i'm i'm ready for tuesday i only have to wait only a few more hours till thursday not tuesday thursday today's tuesday thursday thursday please get here already i want my lich king bald yeah um this is definitely man defining card this is going to be all over the place mainly because of how value centric this card is now Eddie does know my thoughts on value-centric cards and whether they need to be in every single deck. We've had this discussion. Me, personally, I don't think they should be. I don't. I think that if your deck doesn't necessarily run better, that if your deck wants to go more of a synergistic route and doesn't really need the, need the card, there's no point shoe, shoehorning the card in just because, well, the value's too good. If there's room, yes, but if there's not, I, I feel that you shouldn't shoehorn cards like this in. But they're going to be all over the place anyway, just like Dr. Boom was uh, back in the old Goblins vs. Gnome meta. 
it's, this card's going to be all over the place. There are several different decks that I think will really uh, want to be running this card. There are several decks that I don't think should be running this card or will, or will want to be running this card. But you know what? They're going to be running this card anyway. It's going to be all over the place. Will I be running this card? Yes. But I'm going to be a little bit more um, choosy on which decks have them. And I'm going to be asking, again, the central question, does uh, does this fit into to this deck, yes or no? And if no, it doesn't go in the deck. So this will be all over the place, yes. Uh, I expect that as long as it's in standard, it will be in every single deck. Uh, Wild, I don't think Wild really cares, because what happened to Dr. Boom and Wild? It faded into obscurity. It's in some decks, but the whole point in Wild is they go more of a synergistic route, because they're more interested in what their decks want to do, because more and more cards are going to be printed over time. You really need to keep that in mind all the time. You can't put every single value-focused card in a deck and expect it to win, because... It's been shown in the long run, it's not going to. You want your deck to do something very specific, have a very specific end goal in mind, and work for that. In general, the Lich King does not do that. The Lich King gives you value cards that can help you, but that's not your main end goal. But people in but players in standard are going to be using this all over the place anyway, so there you go. But I do think it's a very powerful, powerful card. I do think it's probably a must-craft day, uh, day one, just because it's going to be all over the, all over the place, and, and in the decks that do want to use it, it's going to be extremely powerful. So yes, this is meta-defining. Uh, you probably if you you probably should think about crafting this, because if not, you're going to be crafting this anyway. Let's just say it. It's it's going to be everyone's going to have it because everyone will realize that they at some point they might actually just need to have. I mean, if anything, I may be stupid and just go, you know what, screw it, I'm going to craft a golden one of it, because, you know, just, I about knocked the moon out of tilt and orbit with how freaking hard I got when I saw it, because it's... <laughs> Funny story, though, we've been talking about this, and we've been comparing it to the value, the, the ultimate value min min minion of old, which was um, Dr. Boom. Do you know that I I actually did not have a Dr. Boom. I actually had to craft it. Craft it. I did not have or craft a Dr. Boom until after it had rotated out. And this is why I am such a, such a big proponent because I am of the opinion you don't need to have have it in every single deck. You might not even need it. Need the, such value cards, and you can build very solid decks without them. And that's why I did. Uh. When I got Doctor, when I got Doctor Boom, it was essentially to fill in a, a need after Lepronome got nurtured into Oblivion, and I couldn't use the synergies I used to in Necromancer. I needed something to fill in. Um, so for me, the Lich King, I see how powerful it is. I'm not putting it in every deck. Screw you! It's not happening. It will go in the decks I want it to go in, and only in those decks. Everybody else, you can do what you want. I advise you to to keep 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 your deck strategy and synergy in mind, because ultimately, in the long run, this is not a card that wins you games. This is a card that can help you out, but you need to know what your deck wants to do, and keep that in mind and build towards your deck's strengths, and that's how you're going to win. Anything else you want to say, Eddie, before we move on? And then, sorry, can't hear you. Too much Lich King. Nee, nee, nee. <laughs> also, Black Knight. Black Knight can just wipe this off. So, like, that's Is this the gotta... Black Knight meta? It very well might be. Uh, every single release. Death Re Next up, we have Death Revenant, which is a 5 cost 3 3 warrior minion with the battle cry gain plus 1 plus 1 for each damaged minion. Oh, this is going to see play. This is going to be so strong, and this is going to be so stupid. The reason this is going to be see, see play is because... Frothing Berserker sees play. And this is not damage-friendly minion. This is each damaged minion. So you could follow up with... Have a Frothing, frothing Berserker do something where basically it, it whirlwinds, damages everything, gets the frost, Frothing Berserker really big... And then the next turn, you can play this, and it just 
gets bigger based on everything. And you can play this no matter what, and it has a chance of getting really big really quickly and being nigh un unstoppable. I I think this can see play in most warrior decks. And I think this is just a very powerful card for pretty much the same reason that Frothing Berserker is a powerful card. Because um, that battle cry is going to go off multiple times, guys. It's going to be big, no matter when it comes down. So yeah, this could see play. This could be potentially meta-defining. <sighs> Better dust off the old uh, big game hunter and let him know, oi, we got the beast in our sights. Because just... If it makes it where it's like, okay, each damaged minion. With that new warrior tap because of Death Knight, oh, that thing's going. Th this thing, if you draw a late game and your opponent's already burned their resources, ew. Just ew. I. It could be meta defining, or it could just like fade off into obscurity. Really depends. Like, it really does. So, just. Do we have enough time? Oh, yeah, we have enough time. Keep, going, keep on going. Dead Scale Knight. It's a one cost, one one Murloc. Life steal. Okay. You printed us a Murloc this set. Bulb. It could potentially see play, mainly because of lifesteal, and I guess, and like, Murloc, and Murlocodin, being able to buff that up could be really scary, uh, because you wouldn't really feel bad about using your, li using your life to, to attack, if that's, a, if that's an issue. Other than that, I don't really see how it's going to see play. I mean, I think it's a long shot in Murlocodin, but... Even then, I'm not really sure, so... It's a Murloc, Shrug. <laughs> it's Murloc. Next up, we have Scr uh, Scourge Lord Garrosh, who is the Warrior Death Knight. He costs 8. His battle cry is he equips a 4-3 Shadow Morn that also damages adjacent minions. That's lovely. His hero power is Blaze Storm. It costs 2, and it deals 1 damage to all minions. I don't know whether you want to call this uh, Whirlwind Warrior, whether you want to go and call it, like, old, like it's essentially a Patron Warrior. And in Patron Warrior, this is going to be nuts. This is going to be an, inclu must, uh, an include. Number one, let's talk about that Shadow Morn, shall we? Just the fact that it can damage adjacent minions. So pretty much, you can basically get a little bit choosy about where you attack. So you can't take the, less uh, the least amount of damage and still do maximum damage to pretty much help clear the board. That Shadow Morn is really disgusting. And then your Blade Storm, because if you're running this, you're running this in a patron style deck uh, with all of these different minions that basically uh, want to get damaged. And basically, you Whirlwind. And you just do all of these buffs and make them stronger and put more things on your board. And it's just disgusting all around. I'm thinking if I get this, Eddie, I'm going into wild. I'm making a new type of patron deck uh, that is not is that is just focused on those type of effects and just being more mid rangey and atta and attacking that way. I'm I will kind of be exploring that avenue. Uh, this is a kind of interesting effect. I think this is kind of strong. Uh, this could bring back the patron style warrior deck back into standard. I mean, there's no going to be no patrons, but they have plenty of replacements, uh, and so that's actually kind of exciting. We've been going over some of them as we've been uh, reviewing cards, and this is how they all come together. So this is very strong. This is a really cool deck, um, a really cool uh, Death Death Knight, and I think that the type of deck that you build with it uh, could potentially become meta-defining, because uh, I know there's a lot of people who like playing Patron, uh, Patron Warrior, and I think that those type of players will be willing to go back and create this sort of deck. So I do think that we will see this deck emerge in the meta, and I think this has the potential to be very strong. And I'm kind of excited. I kind of want to see where this goes. Oh, yeah. Especially with having to think about, okay, i got to be able to position my creatures in this way so that this one doesn't die, 
and then, oh, wait, why is this one? Ah, uh, Frostmourne, drop. And then you've also got the idea of just that tap. That tap is disgusting. Because you get a constant whirlwind going. So it's just like, all right, first tap whirlwind. Next turn, if things are still alive on my board, whirlwind again. And you can just keep constantly triggering cards in your deck, like execute, sleep with the fishes, and the like. So it's just like, this, I I'm going to say it, it's a meta-defining Death Knight. So, there we go. We have enough time for one more? We have enough time. Yeah, we're going to Drain Soul. Two cost, Warlock spell, Lifesteal, deal two damage to a minion. Okay. I can do a little bit of buffing with spell damage minions and get more health. Better than that. Okay. Well. This is a very good, sp very good spell. Uh, I think it will definitely see play. I think it's actually pretty, very strong. So yeah, I think this is a card that will see play in Warlock, and I think it will become a a standard card in Warlock. And I think it's definitely going to be seeing play. I don't want to say it's meta-defining, because I don't think it's that strong, but I think it will be seeing a lot of play in the, the upcoming meta. So next up, we have Drakari Enchanter, which is a 3-cost 1-5 minion with the effect your end-of-turn effects tw trigger twice. Given some of the minions that we that have end of turn effects in this meta, and this and this uh, and this uh, expansion, and especially that's out in the meta right now, including the Lich King, this has the potential to see play. I'm just gonna say the potential. The reality is that we've seen plenty of cards like this in previous meta and metas and previous expansions, and they never really see a lot of play. They end up being these niche cards. But they end, but people will just end up relying on the main cards themselves and not on the cards that will, you know, make make effect, effects trigger twice or that. The only card that was the exception to the rule was Brand, and that's because you were actively playing that uh, that bow cry. Um, so I I may be wrong on this. I just don't think this is going to see a lot of play. I think that you're going to be going for more solid more solid minions in this card slot, and you're just going to be interested in just keeping those uh, specific uh, minions with end-of-turn effects alive in general, that you're not going to just want something... You're not going to want a Drakari Enchanter there just to get two effects to go off. I, I, I don't think it's really going to... really going to be a part of the meta. I don't think it's going to be played. I'm torn because, like, I have the list in front of me of things that it can trigger and actually boost off of. And it's like, okay, so start at the top. Ethereal Arcanist. Control the secret, plus four, plus four. Grime Street Enforcer. Give all your minions in your hand, plus two, plus two. Raglite Lord. Primal Fin Totem. I'm getting two Murlocs. Manatai Totem. Draw two. Blood Imp. Give a friendly minion plus one health twice. Trafficker. Add two random demons to your hand. Grimy Gadgeteer, give a random minion in your hand, plus two, plus two, twice. Young Priestess, plus one health, twice. Friendly Bartender, restore one health to your hero, twice. Master Swordsmith, plus one attack. And I just, I can keep going on, like, we've got Rose, Twyelder, Hogger, Rule Ysera, Yasharaj, Healing Totem, Nether Portal, Summon four three two M's, which hey, I mean you could be playing discard lock tentatively. Uh, just from Frozen Throne alone, Cobalt Scale Bane, Shadow Ascendant, Despicable Dreadlord, and the Lich King. And then like you also think about Wild, and there's just a small list there like Kelthazod, Ragnaros, and Emperor Therusian. I would say are the top three you'll probably sit this next to potentially. But as far as, like, all this goes like right now in Standard and in Wild, I don't know if you'll want to actually use this. 
because it's like, okay, we've got the dream going. I, I just gave all the minions in my hand, plus two, plus two. Or I did a double rag shot with this thing. So it's just like, a lot of the cards that you're going to try to want to combo this with are in the upper tiers as far as cost goes. So you have to set it up and make sure it lives long enough for you to be able to actually get it going. And I just don't know if you can. But that's my thoughts on it. And I stand by what I said. With the exception of Bran Bronzebeard, none of the other minions that have made uh, any sort of effect are giving you the ability to use certain effects twice have seen a lot of play. Baron Rivendare, how much play did it see? I mean, I have it in my Death Rattle deck because I think it's a pretty cool effect. But widespread play? Um, not as much as you would you would think. Um, Garrison Commander, the ability to use your hero power twice, didn't see play. So I'm looking at this and just going... Out of all of these different types of types of similar effects on minions, you had one that was successful. And that's because battle cries are just extremely powerful, and it was easy to basically play Bran and keep him protected and set that up. This is gonna be a lot harder, and just because it there are sustained effects, it's it's pretty much gonna have a target on, on its back right away, and you're really not gonna get a lot of value out of it. And you're really not gonna to wanna to hold on to your onto it for a long time, and it's a 1-5. I, I just think it's just too niche. I, I think that the, that no one's going to be... Everyone's going to be caring about the minions that actually have the effect, that they're really not going to have as much interest in wanting them to go off twice. And so I don't think it's going to see play because of that. It's a, it's a cool concept. But as we've seen time and time again, those type of cool, cool, cool concepts don't really find footing uh, in Hearthstone. So, it'd be cool if it does see play, I just don't think it will. So, anyway, that's it for this, this time, guys. Next time, we should be wrapping things up with our card discussions. Anyway, thank you guys. If you have any comments or anything like that, any, any of your own thoughts, just leave them down in the comments below. And thank you guys for watching. We will see you next time. Bye!